Welcome to Fraud Eats Strategy, an FTI consulting podcast series in which we explore the myriad ways that fraud, corruption, and misconduct can derail strategy and cause havoc. I'm Scott Moritz, a Senior Managing Director in FTI's Forensic and Litigation Consulting segment, where I assist clients and their outside counsel in managing the response to event-driven white-collar crime, misconduct, and bribery incidents. Thank you for listening. In this episode, we're going to explore one of the most intriguing fraud cases in the modern era, Enron, and what this fraud that first came to light in 2001 can teach us about future frauds. To talk with us about that, I'm joined by Sharon Watkins, the owner of Sharon Watkins and Company, and a widely sought after public speaker on ethical corporate leadership. Sharon is best known for her role as the former vice president of corporate development at Enron, where she famously authored a memo four months before Enron's December 2001 bankruptcy filing, in which she warned then CEO Ken Lay about accounting irregularities and that the company might, quote, implode in a wave of accounting scandals. And so it did. Uh, Ms. Watkins subsequently testified before Congress and was co-named Time Magazine Person of the Year in 2002 for her role in exposing the Enron accounting scandal. Welcome, Sharon. Sharon, when you were at Enron, you saw numerous red flags that caused you to raise your concerns to leadership. The Enron case has been a much studied investigation in business schools and to teach the next generation of forensic accountants and compliance officers. Uh, The case brought things like uh, mark to market accounting, off balance sheet finance and special purpose entities, an alliance with Blockbuster Video, accounting firm independence and ethical leadership into focus. Uh, So much has changed since then. Passage of Sarbanes-Oxley, more recently Dodd-Frank, the creation of the PCAOB, uh, changes in auditor independence and internal control standards. What about Enron is still relevant today and can be instructive to audit committees, compliance officers, and anti-fraud practitioners? Well, that's a good question, Scott, and uh, thank you for having me on your podcast. I love the title of it, Fraud Eats Strategy for Lunch. That's certainly true. Um, Enron's really the poster child for mega corporate scandal. It is still studied in graduate programs across the country and really across the globe. I would say that the primary issue with Enron which is similar to many other organizations, is that success and even great success ends up creating some lax attitudes towards compliance and procedure and protocol. What comes to mind is the Columbia shuttle disaster from early 2003, where there had been from strikes on the shuttle in the past that hadn't meant anything. This particular foam strike was frozen, bigger, harder, concerned that it hit a vulnerable part of a wing edge. And of course, we now know what happened. The shuttle you know, fell apart on re-entry. There's been a lot of study of the Columbia shuttle disaster. And the, one of the main primary conclusions is that the prior success of the shuttles caused lax behavior. The prior, you know, oh, this was no big deal on the foam strikes, caused lax behavior. Well, I'd say the same thing with Enron. We had stellar stock performance. Our stock price was just rising, rising, rising. Our executives were on the cover of Business Week, Fortune, Forbes. Harvard had a case study on Enron. Darden had a case study on Enron. We were held up as the poster child for the 21st century economy, new model company. All that success can make people just not as alarmed as they should be when they see violations of the compliance procedures that are in place. When they see violations of procedures and policies and protocols. I'll wrap up my comments with the most egregious. Enron's board of directors waived the company's code of conduct to allow the CFO, Andy Fastow, the chief financial officer, to start an outside investment partnership where he was general partner. He raised $500 million of limited partner money and he created this investment partnership and its sole purpose in life was to do business with Enron. Now that is a conflict of interest that is unbelievable and prohibited by the code of conduct. 
yet the board of directors waived the code of conduct requirement prohibiting that to allow him to do so. Love to see how that was reflected in the board minutes. <laughs> That's, uh, that, that, that must have been some artful wording. Well, it's just shocking. It really is shocking. And, and without that waiver of the code of conduct to allow this conflict of interest, Enron's fraud wouldn't have happened. Well, I've read a lot about Enron, and I don't recall reading that fact, which is a pretty compelling fact. Talk about the, the antithesis of tone at the top. Exactly. And of course, there's been oh over a dozen books written on Enron. There were over 13 congressional committees that investigated Enron and produced reports. And then there was all kinds of litigation, both criminal and civil. But one of the reports that came out that was a good diagnostic on Enron was the Powers Report. It was issued in February of 2002. And they did comment that although it was just outrageous that the board waived the code of, of conduct to allow this conflict of interest, they also said that Arthur Anderson, Enron's outside auditors, and Vincent and Elkins, their outside lawyers, gave the wrong impression to the board. Yeah, there were so many contributing factors, what the ultimate outcome was. That, that's really interesting. So there have been quite a few accounting scandals since Enron, WorldCom, Madoff, MF Global, Toshiba. You could, you can spend the next hour listing them. And it's not as though Sarbanes-Oxley or Dodd-Frank have stopped fraud in its tracks. What is it about the Enron matter that makes its lessons as relevant today as they were in, in 2001? Well, I think what's interesting with Enron versus WorldCom or HealthSouth or a few of the other scandals, in WorldCom's case, it was really about six or seven people in the CFO's office that were cooking the books, that were making top side entries, and they knew they were, they were doing wrong. HealthSouth, same thing, they had two sets of books. Enron is more interesting to study. Madoff, too. He knew it was a Ponzi scheme. Um, but with Enron, there was always a wrapper of legitimacy. You know, the off-balance sheet debt really should have been on, but, you know, they were trying to make this square peg fit into a round hole. The related party transactions weren't, you know, the code of conduct waiver and what Andy was doing with his investment partnership just weren't scrutinized. But everything was papered. There wasn't a second set of books. There weren't top side entries being made. It was just very, very complex accounting fraud. And so why it's interesting to study it is that it involved a lot more people, not just the outside auditors, not just the outside law firms, but also the banks, uh, Citibank, Chase, and CIBC, the Canadian bank, settled shareholder litigation for over $2 billion apiece. Um, six billion came into that shareholder fund because they had all kinds of emails where they knew they were lending Enron money that should have been on Enron's books as debt, but Enron was putting it in these complicated structures and booking it as free cash flow as if they had sold assets. And so the banks had emails talking about their reputational risk, the concerns, should we be concerned about these the lending and so forth. And all that hurt them, you know, in these, in these shareholder cases and they settled for big time dollars. So you've got the banks, you've got outside auditors, you've got outside lawyers, but then within Enron, you do have a pretty large population of in-house lawyers and accountants and business managers that knew something was wrong and didn't speak up or even it helped create the problem. Well, well that's, a, that's a great segue to the, our next question. You know, the, the whole speak up culture. You know, there's been a lot written about ethical culture in the past few years, whether it's the sexual harassment scandals of Harvey Weinstein and, and Steve Wynn and the rise of the Me Too movement or um, ethical meltdowns at blue chip organizations like Volkswagen or FIFA. Uh, and countless others, the, the term ethical culture is really inescapable. What tangible steps organizations need to take right now to avoid becoming the next punchline on late night television? 
Well, certainly a robust system for bad news to get to the top is needed. The best run organizations have an, someone out of the general counsel's office usually, and they are the receiver of bad news, the employee hotlines, the anonymous reporting. And if done right, they never try to identify the messenger or shoot the messenger. Instead, they reach into their toolkit and do employee interviews, employee surveys, look top to bottom into the offending department. And, um, you know, generally it doesn't take long, one to two weeks, and they know whether this is a real issue that needs to be addressed or, you know, not. And so you need a robust system for bad news to get to the top. In Enron's case, Ken Lay gravitated towards good news and did not want to hear bad news. And as a result, the HR department really had an unspoken policy that if a complaint came in from an employee that had been let go, you just chunked it in the trash because clearly they were a disgruntled employee because they'd been let go. So it didn't matter whether there was merit, truth, a problem discovered in what they were reporting, it got chunked in the trash. So Enron lacked an ability for bad news to get to the top. That's an, I think that's an important lesson for people to hear because you know you, you can have all of these confidential reporting mechanisms, the various channels through which information is supposed to be you know sort of re- reported upward, but you know it, it's um, you, you like to think that when you, you put yourself out there um, that it's not going to fall on deaf ears or, or not fall on ears at all. So that's, a, that's, that's an amazing piece of information. So your title at Enron was Vice President of Corporate Development. Uh, where presumably you oversaw acquisitions and post-merger integrations. What steps should companies take in their acquisition due diligence that go beyond the typical financial and legal due diligence to provide some assurance that the company's not buying, you know, ongoing fraud or a corruption scheme? Well, I think the number one thing to do in due diligence and mergers and acquisitions is talk to the customers of the target company ensure that people like doing business with them, that they view them as fair, you know, that basically what you're looking for is a company that takes pride in their goods and services and how they treat their employees and their customers. So you want to see that there's just not a lot of noise around that. And I give Enron as a counter example to that because at the same time the accounting fraud was going on, um, Enron was manipulating the California energy market. If you remember back then, California was having some serious issues, and the governor of California was saying he can't wait to see Enron's executives sitting in a jail cell. You know, there was back and forth noise all about what Enron was doing. It came out that people were calling us, you know, like the Death Star, you know, that people had kind of black and evil nicknames for Enron. Customers did. So those kind of things are important. What's the water cooler talk? you know, where there's smoke, there's usually fire, make sure that, that there's good vibes about your acquisition target company. That's interesting because so often in acquisition due diligence, it's a fairly tight circle of people who are spoken to and, or, or for that matter are made available to the, to the diligence team. Uh, and it typically is limited to a subset of the management team and it seldom extends outside of the borders of the acquisition target. It's very interesting, you know, sort of important point you make about what are the customer's impressions because that's... Well, and certainly I'm talking about friendly acquisitions and mergers. A hostile takeover, you know, you're, you're probably wanting some stealth before that happens and, and it wouldn't be as easy to do. But when you're talking about two companies that are coming together and agreeing to be acquired or sold, you know, some sort of merger, you should be able to, to do some customer interviews. Yeah, just it makes, it makes perfect sense. I mean, so much of the value that you hope to derive from the merger or the acquisition is the continued goodwill with the customer base, the revenue associated with those customers. And, and if you start to even get an inkling that there's, um, there's tension at play there, um, I think that's very important in terms of, you know, whether the deal is viable and, and what value to place on the, on the future revenues. It's a, it's a really uh, interesting point. So the term whistleblower seems to have been slowly losing its stigma since you first came forward in 2001. 
Uh, corporate hotlines and incident management systems are widely in use. Uh, confidential reporting mechanisms are you know, considered hallmarks of an effective compliance program. And the SEC whistleblower program has paid out over 400 million since the program's inception in 2001. Right now, there are scores, if not hundreds of executives and employees who are each kind of trying to summon the same courage and resolve that you're able to in order to report organizational fraud, misconduct, or corruption. What advice would you give them, and how can they protect themselves against retaliation? Well, the best news that's happened in the almost two decades since Enron's collapse is the bounty provision that is within the Dodd-Frank Act that passed in 2010. So this bounty provision gives 10 to 30 percent of SEC fines to the whistleblower that brought the information to the SEC. So what that has done is it has attracted a fair amount of legal talent to the cause of the whistleblower. Basically in the early 2000s, if you were would-be whistleblower trying to get advice, you had one or two places you could go to and that was it. And they were kind of hard to find. Now, since the passage of the Dodd-Frank Act, if you type in whistleblower advocacy, whistleblower legal help into Google, you will get a dozen firms that have departments with lawyers that specialize in advocating for the whistleblower. And this has been a tremendous benefit because most would-be whistleblowers, you know, they might be accountants, they might be operating people, they're doing their job. They are, they are not lawyers, they have no idea what they're getting into. Their goal is for company, the company to, to know that something is going wrong and to correct it. More often than not, they are just trying to get the company to realize, oops, we've made some bad moves, let's get back on the right path. They do not know what they're stepping into, and quite often companies do want to shoot the messenger or attack them where they lose credibility. So the wonderful thing about all this legal help is you know, you can get some guidance just off their web pages, but you can stay anonymous. You've got that attorney-client privilege. You can hire an attorney because they, they can be paid out of that bounty provision. So since there's a way for these lawyers to be paid, you know, they're, they're there. And let me tell you, it's, it's changed the landscape completely. Well, and I think those are great points. I also think it, the SEC whistleblower program forces organizations to give appropriate amounts of consideration to whistleblower complaints that come internally because, you know, ignoring them, you know, to a certain extent, you're, you're kind of uh, forcing that person's hand if they're not going to be given credence, if people aren't going to act on that information that's being conveyed through internal reporting channels, then that person's options narrow. They, they may well uh, avail themselves of the whistleblower hotline, you know, at, at the SEC. And it's not a great scenario for the, for the issuers that, uh, you know, so I do think that the mere threat of an SEC whistleblower matter will, I think, really does force the hand of certain organizations to take these whistleblower matters seriously and, and, and to do what's appropriate. I agree. I think it's a great check and balance. Oh, to- absolutely. So sadly, we're in a down economy, and that's when a lot of accounting schemes tend to come to light. It doesn't necessarily uh, lead to maybe increased incidence of accounting fraud so much as it is an increase in discovery, you know, and, and, you know, right now we're in an unprecedented uh, economic crisis with a widespread impact. Can you offer any predictions for frauds that are likely to come to light? And can you offer any advice to the organizations touched by those frauds? I heard an SEC commissioner say once that when you put any kind of fluff in your numbers, be it using cookie jar reserves, anything that you're doing, that is bordering on fraud, you're the one that's putting the pressure on the organization. Now, this particular person said noose around the neck, but she really meant you're the one putting the pressure on the organization. 
because now next year you want to grow your numbers. You're now growing your numbers on real numbers plus fluff. And the year after that, you're growing numbers on real numbers plus fluff plus fluff. And so if there's any kind of downturn, your schemes are exposed. My advice would be come clean as soon as you can, form that crisis management team, um, shore up cash and, and develop it the right plan. Get the right experts. Don't cover up, don't deny what has happened. Well, thank you, Sharon. So that's all the time we have today. You've shared some incredible insights with us and, and we can't thank you enough for, for, for taking part in this episode. Well, thank you for having me, Scott. This concludes this episode of Fraud Eat Strategy. I'm Scott Moritz, Senior Managing Director in FTI Consulting's Forensic and Litigation Consulting segment. And stay tuned for the next episode of Fraud Eat Strategy, when we'll hear from Jenner and Block partner and former Special Inspector General for the Troubled Asset Relief Program, Neil Borofsky, on how fraud has nowhere to hide in a down economy and what to do about it. If you have an idea on a fraud or a corruption case, topic or guest you'd like to hear from on a future episode, email us at fraudeatstrategy at fticonsulting.com. Thanks for listening.